Hello everyone, I'm Susanne Henschel and I'm very, very happy to have the opportunity to moderate this panel today on queer feminist strategies against gender-based violence, which I'm moderating together with my comrade and friend uh, Jana Flörchinger. And I'm also very happy about the panel in the morning, which I found very interesting and like a very good basis for our debate now in the afternoon. Um, before we introduce our speakers, I will tell you a bit why we came together for this panel today. And one small thing, we will do it a bit differently than the classic panel, so we're not having input, 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 and then Q&A, but rather have a discussion here among us, and then include you with your questions in the end. So, why is it important to talk about anti-feminism and gender-based violence at a Congress on authoritarianism? In the previous panel, it became very clear that anti-feminism is a core element of right-wing ideology and that it connects different fractions from far right to the center of society. Reactionary movements come together in opposing queer feminist concerns. They vary in their intensity and strategy, but they're united in the cause. For this reason too, queer feminists, uh, a response to the strengthening of authoritarianism must always be a queer feminist one. Secondly, authoritarianism is not just a rule or a regime, but it also comes from below and becomes visible in social practices and the way we relate to each other. In that sense, it's our task to take a closer look at what role gender-based violence plays in neoliberal authoritarian societies. And now to the positive side. We're also here to talk about resistance. And we see strong feminist and queer movements around the globe that do not only revolve around sexism, but question the economic and political system as a whole. In these movements, it is possible to connect struggles against sexual violence, economic exploitation, colonial domination and extractivism. We see that, for example, in Chile, where against all pressures from the right, a process for a new constitution with a strong feminist perspective is happening right now. And Javiera will tell us more about that later on. But not only in Chile, also in other contexts, activism against gender-based violence has been a glue for different feminist struggles on the one hand, and in opposition to authoritarian regimes on the other. One example for that is the feminist strike movement that was happening a lot in a lot of different countries. In our view, one of the main potentials of queer feminist strategies is to, to provide a common ground for not just thinking about a better future for everyone, but also to ask us how we can build that. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I'm gonna hand over to Jana who will introduce our speakers. Thank you, and uh, Susanne, and also from my side, a very warm welcome to everybody. I will introduce now our amazing speakers, but before that, I uh, want to state something very briefly. I had corona <laughs> the last days, and my head might be a little bit foggy still, so if I say something really stupid, it might be because of that. So just a small heads up on that. But now to our amazing speakers. Javiera Manzi is a sociologist and, at the, and, and studied at the University of Chile and she's a feminist activist at the Coordinadora, M, Fe, Coordinadora Feminista Ocho M. And she's also a researcher, a curator and a writer on social movements, arts and politics and she has written books and articles about feminist politics and also about social revolt in Chile. Javiera, you were also the spokesperson of Coordinadora Ocho M in the feminist strike movement in Chile in 2020, and now you're working with Alondra Carrillo in the Constituent Assembly. Hello. <laughs> nice to have you here. And we also have here Magdo Hujratska. Magdo is a queer activist at Constellation of Liberation in Berlin and is also and is also doing a PhD at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Their main focus is set on queer rights, gender, feminism, right-wing populism and digital media, especially social media and the internet culture. Magdo also holds a professional dancer's diploma and applies their knowledge and professional experiences to de deconstruct the normative understanding of bodies and gender. Hello, Magdo. <laughs> and we also have here with us Rupali Banzode. 
and Rupali is a Dalit feminist and a social anthropologist from India. And she is currently based in Munich and she will join in the University of Pennsylvania very soon in a postdoctoral, as a postdoctoral fellow next month. At the University of Pennsylvania, you also will spread here heading the Caste and Race Initiative. Her research lie on the intersections of race, caste, gender and violence. And before we go to discussion, we also have like a small experience with us that Susanna is going to introduce to us. Yeah. We ask all our panelists uh, to bring a small item to the panel um, that resembles their feminism or activism. And we did that because we think that um, feminism always also draws from personal experience and everyday life. And we thought it's nice to start the panel with a round about that. Um, okay, I brought a book. Uh, which is this. <clears throat> this is a collective book that we wrote about the story, about the multiple voices uh, that united towards uh, the process of the first feminist general strike in Chile in 2019. And this is, um, it, in a way, it's also an archive because it has our declarations, our manifestos, and it also has interviews, and it's um, how we considered our responsibility to tell our, our own story and like to be not only part of the process of changing history, but also being part of the ones who are writing and making a stand of the way we are also portrayed afterwards. So I just wanted to show because for us, it's not only a book, but it's also a form of permanent propaganda. It has, uh, this is the poster the of, <laughs> <laughs> and because we are always trying to multiply uh, our propaganda, I brought a lot of posters, so maybe <laughs> I can share it then. Uh, so, um, because for us it's important that everything that also is part of our books is part of the streets, and it's like the way our uh, struggle has been, like inside and outside institutions. So, my. Now? Oh, yes. yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I didn't bring one item. I came today here in a drag outfit because I also do perform as a drag performer. And it's such an important thing for me because I talk a lot about bodies and politicizing bodies and having a queer body and moving through the society is in itself a political act. And uh, also one part of the whole um, costume or outfit is the small bag, which is white, and it's from my first communion when I was mm, eight years old or nine, eight years old. I grew up in Catholic Poland, so as you can imagine, I had this white outfit, I had like a white flowers in my hair, and it's very symbolic for me because I, it was not my choice. It was not my choice to enter this community, and it is difficult to um, free yourself from that Catholic, extremely oppressive community, especially in Poland. And I remember when my uh, religion teacher said, this is a sacred thing and you should keep it as, you know, kind of like a souvenir of the moment where you welcome Jesus in your heart. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to have it here and I'm going to make it as queer as possible. <laughs> so yeah, that's the you know the connections of queerness and and makeup and bodies and and also religion and the oppression that we experience as queer people from the Catholic Church that's um, that's very important for me so that's kind of what is symbolizing. Well, thank you very much, all the three of you. I think it's so important to consider these personal stories and these personal connections like with your body and also with the experience and the collective to be part of feminist analyzers as well. I think it's what feminism is very strong and it's like um, take it's, it's like the the daily experiences that we make to consider them as the collective experiences and then draw analyzes from that and um, I think it also helps us in the sense of a transnational solidarity to help us to understand different contexts if we share these experiences and these stories with each other, not just like the analytical discussion, which is obviously as well as important. So um, 
we also discussed during the the conference now that um, author that it during the conference it became very clear that authoritarianism rep represents itself in a very in very different ways and in every in every shape um, that one can just imagine. And um, before we were be going to discuss later on the queer feminist counter strategies, we want to take a look at the specific experiences and analyzes in Poland, in Chile, and in India. And um, so we, now we're going to explore um, how authoritarianism operates from a feminist and queer perspective and how it is crucial and what is the function especially of anti-feminism and gender-based violence um, in, this, in this context. So I would like to start with you, Javiera. Um, Chile is very well known as the laboratory of neoliberalism both during the dictatorship of Pinochet, but also beyond that, during the 90s, the privatization is so strong and the, the debt on the country, but also in everyday life, it plays a huge role. So throughout the conference, we've talked a lot about the connections of authoritarianism and neoliberalism. And I would like to ask you, what would be a feminist reading of these connections of authoritarianism and liberal, uh, and authoritarianism and neoliberalism, and also how gender-based violence is inscribed in this neoliberal order? <coughs> yes, um, well, I, um, that's a very good question because it helped us to start talking about the whole idea or the whole um, the process of how Coordinadora Feminista 8M uh, started to organize as a collective, um, precisely in the question of how to relate gender violence with a neoliberal um, system and how to engage feminist struggle with anti-capitalist struggles, with uh, anti-extractivist struggles, with anti-racist struggles, that we uh, thought it was like a, like a main concern for our strategic views and like how to understand, uh, not just from a point of view that tries to uh, see feminism as like a specific agenda, but to understand it as like a necessarily a form of a transformative perspective that understands a, and struggles towards a complete change of the forms that life is organized. So um, in 2018, we had the first, um, we had like every year in every country or most countries that, are, that do actually manifest during the 8th of March, um, we, there's a group of different feminists that organized uh, this march uh, that were uh, actually being part before of Nuna Menos Chile, you know, like from 2015, and because of uh, in, in Argentina, this uh, transnational feminist movement against gender violence also had a very important impact in Chile. And there were like major uh, mobilizations, but also assemblies and stuff. And the thing is that from then on, it was uh, clear that we had to make a statement not only about gender violence as if it was like a specific issue, but how to understand it like in the center of, uh, of precisely that, no? like the, the a struggle to dismantle authoritarian and neoliberal uh, system. So the way we had to, the way we tried to thought about that, it was actually up with. Um, the, the way we called this march, and it was uh, the main um, shout of the march was uh, working women against the precariousness of life. And this idea of precariousness of life has been very important to us because it's helped us to connect all of these dots. And we call it precariousness of life and not only precariousness uh, of labor, how it's usually used, because we understand that neoliberalized lives have uh, impact in every form of, uh, every way life is organized, not only human life, but of course the way we understand the devastation of our territories and communities and how we uh, understand the uh, precariousness of our intimacy and, our, and the sexual politics of uh, our daily life. 
So it was very important to us to start by that idea that the struggle of the feminist struggle was against the precariousness of life. And then on, we carry out a process to uh, prepare ourselves for the next year and to have a, the first feminist uh, general strike. You must know that in Chile, there's no right to a strike. Like neoliberal, uh, well, not till today. I, I'm going to talk about that later, about the constituent process, of course. But uh, till today, we don't have the right to have a strike. And it was very important that it was actually the feminist movement, the one that started to talk about strikes. It was not the unions. It was not like traditional uh, working class uh, organizations, but actually the feminist movement that started to talk about a general strike. And we said it must be general in the sense, of course, and productive and reproductive work. And to do that, so, we had to connect all of this with our own program. We call it like that, a program for uh, against the precariousness of life. And we had like this um, plurinational meeting of um, women and dissidences who struggle, that's how call it, and it's precisely in that moment when we connect all the dots and make our own program. And to answer, yes, uh, because we understand that a, pro a feminist program has to talk about everything. It has to talk about housing, it has to talk about cities, it has to talk about environmental issues, it has to talk about migration, about economy, about culture, about, uh, because only that form we can actually engage uh, in the, uh, in, a, in a struggle to end with gender violence. So uh, for a lot of time, not, I guess that's been a, one of the major um, things that have changed in Chile. Because when, when we started with this, they would say, what has, uh, uh, what has feminism to do with, I don't know, uh, environmental struggles? What has feminism to do with uh, migration? What has it to do with unions? What has it to do um, with uh, everything, of course, that extends to our own lives as well. So uh, it was important for us to understand that uh, the feminism that we are engaged with, understanding that there's a lot of different feminism, uh, there's some that aren't actually very uh, in the same idea of what, how we understand it. Like, it's definitely a trans-feminist movement, and it's definitely an anti-racist and an anti-capitalist movement, but it's also a massive, a massive movement. It constructs majorities. We're not interesting in being like uh, a place. We're not interesting like being just an identity, one, an, another identity. But how we can connect and make a major alliances, and since then, like major transformations. Thank you very much, Javiera, for pointing this out. That the feminist movement and also thinking in a feminist way is like. It's somehow like uh, the potential is there, like some like a shared or transgressive common hori horizon, right? That um, that connects different struggles and um, and and resistance, of course. I would like to ask you now some question, Magdo. And um, in Poland, we have this LGBTQI free zones on the one hand, and we have the abortion ban. Um, so. Like this is like the the abortion ban is something that we observe in so many different countries as well, and um, it's a little bit more well known. And uh, but in the LGBTQI um, free zones is something that that well, to my knowledge, I I don't know that's from any other place. And so, I would like to ask you how does this authoritarian government? regulate the bodies of women and queers and why is anti-genderism especially such a core element of right-wing politics and also from below in, uh, in, in, in Poland? Yes, yes, okay, I'm sorry, my God. <laughs> so I think one thing that is really important about Poland is the very traditional division and understanding of 
I want to say gender, but people don't understand what gender is in Poland. It's um, we have there is a Polish word that is um, it's płeć, but there is no distinction between you know biological sense, sociological sense, and many other ways how you can use because in English you still kind of or in German also you have different terms, but in Polish kind of gender was accepted by not only the activist sphere, but also by right-wing populists and politicians. And it's used as something foreign, it's something other, it's something coming from the West, and it's something that is not ours. And what is ours is a white Polish Catholic family where there is a man and a woman and they're cis and they're uh, heterosexual and they have a boy and a girl and they just perpetuate this model and everything that in recent years the populist authoritarian um, government of Poland has been trying to do is to protect or they use the protection of this traditional form of family as a way of um, excluding everything else. So it kind of, when Rupali was talking about the Hindu man, it very much reminded me of the rhetoric of, in Poland, is the white Catholic man. And everything that is not him is already on the last position, is already going to be in, excluded in some way. Because this is the only person in the country that is, um, it's, first of all, it's the default. Because every time you talk about something, you use the masculine forms, because Polish is also a very gendered language. Something that I couldn't understand, why is it this way? Now we're starting to use also feminine versions of words or looking for ways of neutralize them, but that's still very, very small. So in order to protect this traditional Catholic family, um, the government introduced, first of all, they didn't sign the um, uh, the Istanbul Convention of uh, against gender-based violence. They rejected it saying that there is the word gender in it and we can't do that. We cannot have sexual education in schools because the WHO said, okay, when the children are I know, four years old, six years old, they were... Um, kind of levels of introducing, uh, you know, some sort of uh, sexual education uh, to children and youth of, of different ages, but this was translated as, by the populist, um, populists, um, as a way of sexualizing children. So that's another thing, it's the gender that is reaching for our children and we cannot let them into schools. There was this great, um, I mean, there still is, uh, I think it's called the Rainbow Friday and I think it's once a year and all the schools, there are activists and they're informing people on different LGBTQIA plus topics, but some schools banned it. Some schools said, you can't be here. You cannot have this rainbow flag. Um, you can't, when I was at school, I was, uh, it was 2006, I was 13 years old. Um, the Minister of Education banned the access to, from school computers to any websites mentioning homosexuality. And in 2006, we didn't have smartphones, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Instagram, all the social media didn't exist. Many people didn't have a computer at home. Um, so it was completely cut off. And there was absolutely no access to any kind of information. And now that it's seeping into the society through various um, like social media or other channels, it's being banned by the, or the, the government is trying to either ban it or exclude it or deem it as something foreign and bad and scary and dangerous. And people many times they protest, we don't want gender in our schools. And I say, 
I also don't want gender in our schools. Why do you have gendered bathroom? That's great. But people don't understand. And this is the, the ignorance that they that the populists are using in this in this moment where they're, you know, there is an, an, an authoritarian populism, there is this notion of othering. There is always someone else. And you have to be scared of those people. You have to I'm gonna protect you from them. And in this case in Poland, the them is the queer community. So uh, like 30% of the country right now. Um, there are some fluctuations, but about 30% of the country's territory are the so-called LGBT-free zones. It's um, it's called that more in the in the public sphere like this, but uh, the people who kind of started it all say that this is the protect our families card. And under this kind of umbrella, um, basically they discriminate against anything that is not cis and heterosexual. Um, so this is one, one way, when you say that you cannot, this is you know, a violation of human rights, they're gonna say, but we're not violating anyone's rights, it's just we're protecting our families. So this is also then very, very much connected to um, these horrible anti-immigrant policies, for example. It's all very much, um, concentrated in this protection, this othering, this sowing fear into the society and cutting people off from the access to information. And everything that comes from the outside is being deemed, this is not ours, this is not Catholic, this is not according to the Bible. And, you know, the authoritarian um, government of Poland they not only do this, they also, they have very, uh, they are very active of, on many, many levels, on the municipal levels, on, in cities, in the government, in the media, and the control that they have already is, we don't even know how deep this goes. And this is something that is going to be extremely difficult to reverse, maybe even impossible. And I think Poland is like a, Poland and Hungary as well. There are two countries who, that are an example of, if I feel, I fear that it's already too late to stop certain changes from happening. I just like, because you said, the, the, the othering is so strong right now and um, especially in Poland, I, I wouldn't like to, maybe you can answer it very shortly, but um, on a more, on a more, on a other, like not on that much on a national scale, but um, we also were talking in, in the preparation about militarization as part of authoritarian um, forms, let's say, and um, with your group collaboration or constellation of liberation, you were also involved in solidarity um, structures and um, helping people coming from um, Ukraine. And um, we we witnessed this massive militarization within in the because of the war in Ukraine, but also beyond. So it didn't start just with the war, of course. And um, but now there's like this huge discourse um, and the militarization of borders, the militarization of security. It, it's, it already happens, but now it's so much more present. And um, what we observe is that this, this militarization discourse um, also helps to to push um, nationalist um, narratives and also to push um, or, or like to enforce nationalism, patriotism, the protection against the other. Who is this other? This is always thought from a heteronormative perspective. So um, in your perspective, maybe you can answer it shortly, but from your perspective, what is the link between the rise of this militarization and the enforcement of heteronormative order? What do, do you have a, some words on that? I mean, for sure, if you look at the eastern border of Poland, on the southern part, the border is open for anyone that is Ukrainian and is white. Um, the rest can come in, but it's difficult. It's going to be made difficult for them by the authorities. 
And then a couple of hundreds of kilometers up north on the border, they're building a huge, it's basically it's already built a huge wall, something like what Trump wanted to build. So it's already there. And it's keeping people, other immigrants who are not white Europeans with blue eyes and Christian and whatsoever, what people say often in the media, and they're being kept away because they're the other ones. So this is also a question of like, okay, so the, it's we are going to invest this money to put guards and put walls and, and put a lot of like military weapons on one part of the border and the other part of the border is going to be uh, used as the stream of military aid to Ukraine and at the same time, Yes, we're going to take all people from Ukraine, but you know, but you can't get an abortion in Poland, for example, if you have been uh, a victim of uh, violence in Ukraine, and if you're running away, you, you you're not going to get this help because abortion is just not. You just can't do it. You just can't get it. Um, or if you're a trans person, you cannot. Some people, some trans people, cannot even leave. Ukraine. So this is also this, as I said, is like a very machoist, Eurocentric um, narrative and discourse around these issues. Whereas the more um, things connected to, for example, rec reproductive health and just the well-being of individuals um, is kind of being pushed aside or not that well or not that discussed in the public sphere. Thank you so much for all your perspectives. And uh, Javiera already started to talk about uh, the feminist resistance against all these things we're facing. And Magdo, uh, I really have to think about this. It's already too uh, late to change some of the things. But still, we want to um, go into detail of what the feminist movements and queer movements are doing right now. One question to you, Magdo, because uh, we were talking about the abortion ban and also about the LGBTIQ-free zones. So, um, at least in Germany, sometimes the pro the feminist protests about abortion is a bit like more classical, a second wave feminist topic. And of course, the protests against the LGBTIQ-free zones was mainly um, done by the queer communities. So how did it go together? In which points were the connections like really productive and where was it difficult to come together? So when it started in Poland, the you know, when we knew that the ban is coming, um, a lot of people, a lot of feminists asked, why do you have to bring a rainbow flag to the protest? Like, why do you always have to do it about LGBTQIA plus? And uh, I think it also is kind of connected to this um, mentality of man, woman, and we're women, and is like, you know, you can't say uh, people who can have children or people who can give birth or people with uteruses or you try to find a different, more inclusive way because then you're erasing women and. There was a lot of um, these issues, and I also felt like after months of protesting where uh, the Strike Kobiet published their postulates, I felt like the queer community was, was excluded, kind of uh, erased from that. Meanwhile, I was talking to people who help um, people from Poland you know, access safe abortions, and they had, for example, a case of a transmasculine person who got pregnant, and those identities from the mm, more public discussions were completely erased, because you mostly saw women um, who were talking about those issues or um, who had, uh, there were at the demonstration, but not that many queer and trans people were included with it. And I hope that today it has changed. I think that um, through those protests where the queer community came together um, at the at the um, strike Kobiet, at those protests that were taking place so intensely in Poland in 2020 and 2021, 
I feel like people understood the necessity of coming together and showing solidarity and overcoming those struggles. And I think this is something that is so important to understand, not only within the Polish landscape, but also just across the borders that we really need to come together uh, as you know, people who are being oppressed by the ruling um, elites and by the uh, capitalist elites that we have to come together and see this oppression not as this is your oppression and this is my oppression. No, we have to fight together because the, also those different oppressions are connected and coming from a certain source. Um, so I think there was a lot of work that had to be put into making people understand that as a queer person, um, that maybe is never gonna have children. I also have th this right, this ban also targets me and also targets many other people around that are not necessarily cis het women who are married or going to get married. And did many people who were protesting the ban also came to the protests of the queer community against the LGBTIQ free zones or did it also like go together the other way around? It was not as intense. It was uh, definitely smaller. I felt like the the protests were smaller and I think people sometimes, if they're not directly affected by it, they don't really show up for others. And on top of that, there is a lot of uh, people who are you know, a part of the LGBTQIA plus community who say, you know, I don't like this. I don't like those loud people wearing weird shoes and makeup. Like, I'm not like that. I just want to live my normal life, meaning upholding the heteropartiarchy. Um, and I just, I just, I'm not going to show up for this because this is too much. They are too loud. They are too colorful. They are too this and that. Um, and that was very painful to see and to experience. And I feel like this is, although there is more and more um, consciousness within the Polish community, there is still a lot of people who don't question certain things, but um, search for these comfortable um, spaces where they can just protect themselves, which I, on one hand, a little bit understand, but at the same time, there is also this notion of, for example, passing. Like, if you are a gay couple, two cis men that pass as straight men, it's it's way different than when you are a queer person. And you know, it's um, why won't you use this privilege of passing and show up for others? And this is something people are not considering doing. Many people don't consider that uh, even as a possibility for them. And even criticize and vocalize their um, negative thoughts and sometimes even hate towards the ones who are really loud and protesting. Thank you. Um, Javiera, you were already talking about uh, the big feminist strikes and the 8th March demonstrations in Chile and also about the role of the feminist movement in the protest in 2019. Uh, there. And uh, you were saying something about that it's not about identity but about majorities and now you're in the whole process for um, having a new constitution, probably, maybe. And can you tell a bit more about why the constitution and what role the feminist movement uh, played in questioning the whole political system and which alliances you were connecting? Well, a little context. So maybe uh, you've heard about this, of course, of how since 2019, since the 8th of October, there was this um, riot, this re social revolt that has um, become the, the start for a constituent process. In South America, there have been, in this progressive cycle of governments in the 2000s, there were a lot of other constituent processes in Ecuador, in Venezuela, 
in Bolivia, but not in Chile. And we, also, we, we say it's like uh, this neoliberal laboratory was like this, um, this place that uh, the right would say, even Piñera, just a couple of weeks before the 18th of October, he would say this is like, uh, there's a border of Chile. There's like this, we are an island in this continent. We don't have any, uh, we are a, uh, the governance of Chile is uh, the order of our democracy, the stability of our economy differentiates us from every other country in the region. And uh, luckily for us, that's not true. <laughs> and uh, we were not, not an island, not even a, a, such a stabilized uh, democracy because of course the stabilization of the uh, Chilean democracy stands for uh, the accumulation of uh, the few, and of course about the stabilization of a neoliberal, a very profoundly neoliberal system. So um, since then, it's inter interesting how the outburst, like how this um, social revolt that started in the streets uh, by the students, uh, student revolt, and then like any, like, common people started to go to the streets because we wanted to say no, that's how we call it, like, uh, very multiple forms to say no to everything that was the way we um, knew life was organized then, no? So it's interesting, like, that these multiple forms of the negation, the, to, to be able to uh, find an alternative in the midst of this necessity to say no to everything that was being uh, offered then as the only way of life, the neoliberal form of life. Um, that became a major necessity and it became the idea of how to make a general transformation. And that's how we end up uh, with the demand of a constituent process because it in a way, it's a form to say everything. We had to change everything. It's not just like one demand. It's not just like one or two laws. It must be the whole institutional uh, system that has to change to dismantle this authoritarian and neoliberal uh, state. So um, in that way, I'd say that uh, feminism had a lot to do in this a possibility to uh, transversalize a perspective towards a transformative perspective that connects all of these different dots. And everyone was then call, uh, talking about the precariousness of life. And it's interesting because that, that started from the feminist uh, struggles was then, that then became uh, the form that everyone used to say, well, everything is wrong now. Yeah. And since then, of course, uh, during the revolt, and for instance, th since the 25th of November, where the first performance of Las Tesis, maybe of course you've heard about that, was very important in Chile because it was like a, a collective um, action that was uh, to denounce um, police violence and gender violence and the very uh, and the connection between uh, both of them, institutional police and gender violence, and it's. I really think it's very important to say this because I know that in many other places, the way they um, heard or they understood um, this performance, they actually think it's only about gender violence, as if you can, like, in a way, encapsulate it. And, uh, but it's actually a very uh, direct form of the... Um, to denounce how, for instance, the repression on women who are um, detained by the police and how we, are, we suffer sexual assaults in the police offices. Um, so, well, so then on, I'd say that, of course, the uh, 8th of March of 2020, it was and it still is the major manifestation that's happened in Chile since the end of the dictatorship in the, uh, 1989. So that's the extent of the feminist potency in Chile. And it's, this extent is also a very, of course, um, demonstrates its force, not only in the massivity of its demonstrations, but also in the radicality of its uh, claim. And I think that's like maybe one of the major, um, I don't know, like forms of our of this for this idea of a political radicality that's also a, a Luke searches for uh, uh, this the majority transformations of a of a new form of a class struggle, 
and that's how we understand it as well. So uh, in terms of alliances, it's been, of course, very important to be very explicit on the alliances, to be very explicit, for instance, that ours is a, a feminist from below, that ours is a feminism that stands for a trans-feminist perspective, and that's very explicit about um, that we're not going to allow any form of transphobia that's also being part of any many, many feminist movements. Uh, so, and also about uh, anti-racist perspective and all. Well, I'm going to show you, actually, <clears throat> I brought, uh, <laughs> I wasn't ready, no, yes, I was. Uh, because I wanted to show this. Yes, okay, this is our, the poster. And if you see, this is the second year we did this poster, and we had to do all of these words. We say that the general feminist strike is anti-racist, is trans-feminist, is anti-capitalist, is uh, against um, jails and it's migrant and it's plurinational and it's transgenerational and it's anti-fascist, anti-extractivist. And of course, many people were like, why do you have to say all those words? I mean, nobody will understand. And then we had the major and more most massive <laughs> demonstration in like more than 30 years in Chile. So we can be radical and we can be massive, and I guess that's the point of it. And um, and also, of course, I'm saying this, and it's it's been of course a lot of work to to try to uh, negotiate, of course, with different groups to negotiate the, for instance, the protagonism of women and um, social, as we say in Chile, not only diversities, but dissent. It's another form to um, name LGBT communities and it's a form to, to, to say not only like, as to celebrate diversity, but in a political stand again, uh, of dissent towards uh, hetero, patriarchal order. So um, it's interesting, like all of this, uh, what we've learned in this, uh, how to, these alliances and how to build a feminist program against precariousness of life, how to build actually a general strike in Chile and these massive mon manifestations were also very important for us to learn how to put everything, all of this in a new constitution. So I just wanted to tell a little about that. Um, it was a very hard process to be part of it. We decided to be part of it as a, as a social movement. That's to say we didn't um, compete as part of a political party. Uh, and that's a lot of others who, do, who did the same as us. Uh, and we actually make a very articulated and alli alliances throughout all the country to put um, these alliances between feminist, social, um, ecological uh, unions and students' movements to build uh, this alternative. And now that we are actually ending the process, because it has like, been for uh, one year, um, I can just want to sh share some of the, what we've like, actually achieved in it. For example, about so um, sexual and reproductive rights. It's not only going to be the first constitution that we'll talk like explicitly about the right uh, for a voluntary interruption of pregnancy, but it's also going to say it explicitly that this is a right for women and pregnant people. And we were going to be very explicit about that. And that's very important because, of course, we know that in a way when we just understand the repetition of this cycle or how you say like this second wave feminism that's different in Chile and it's different in the South because we are not just the repetition of that, but of course it has affected. Uh, we understand it like in these major changes, but that we understand that the idea of there's just one subject or one like idea of feminism has changed today. Um, other major change, for instance, is, of course, that we are going to have a paritarian democracy. That means that for the first time, of, um, as well, in the, in the world, we're, there's a constitution that will say that every single place of political representation, and also a public and semi-public companies, will have to have a paritarian um, formation. This means not all. But this parity, it's not a binary parity. We understand it as, first of all, at least the 50% of women should be in this, in every Congress or in any um, directory. 
it's not, usually it's 50 and 50. No, we're saying that at least 50%. And not only that, we're also saying that this also has to uh, engage with the promotion of the, with the re representation of non-binary people. So this is very important because also we had to understand how the feminism and this important and uh, strategic alliance of a trans feminist and queer alliance in, uh, towards the transformation of democracies has to show not only the idea that there's possible a 50 and 50 uh, re how to repart power, but we have to show that we can actually uh, demonstrate the potency to uh, be as much as we want every place. No? So that's some, something else. And, um, and in the third place, there's a lot of, of course, uh, social rights that are going to be introduced in this new constitution about housing, health, um, labor rights, education. And for, in every single one of them, it's also important to say that we are not only talking about how we recover rights that have been privatized in Chile or in any country t today that ha that's undergoing the pressure of neoliberal uh, reforms, but we're also um, searching for to to create new uh, sorry, to a, a feminist response to that. We don't only want a the right to a public free education, but this must be a public free and non-sexist education. And that's what's going to be now in the new constitution. The same with health, the same for instance with housing. It's not only that we're going to have the right to the city or the right to housing, but it's also that each house and each uh, and the cities must have a um, community infrastructure to uh, socialize the domestic work, for instance. So that's going to be part, like a very transverse uh, perspective, not only about like, in a way, this feminist uh, agenda, but also about every single form of uh, social rights that are going to be part of this new constitution. So in that very sense, we can say that Mm, I wouldn't say like we're going to have a feminist constitution. We don't talk it like that because we understand that constitution is not. But yes, we have had a feminist process that's urged and that transformed the new institutionality in Chile. Thank you um, very much um, for this insight on the constitutional process as well. Um, Talking about the state, <laughs> um, during our discussion it became quite clear or visible that we have or you have very different takes on the role of the state, right? And, um, and institutions in general and um, what it means, what the state or the role of the state main means um, for feminist strategies. So it's obvious that we as a leftist, um, we, are very, we have a strong critique on the state as an institution of um, domination, but of course we also kind of depend on the state, for example, when it comes to reproductive rights, we, we, there has to be reproductive rights and it is a part of institutions. So um, what hopes would you have in parliamentary politics and where are the limits? Magdo, maybe you you can s start saying something about that. Um, so, that's, I don't know how much time do we have. <laughs> There's a lot to say. Right. Well, listening to Javier talk about Chile and like the new constitution, I think that's, that's a great step and that's something very important and I think that's something that a lot of movements can learn a lot from. Um, um, for Poland, which is something that you know I'm more familiar with, um, my first hope would be that people come together and reject the authoritarian rule. And that would be the first step, and of course, in, in the future, I think the rejection of the heteropatriarchy would be, should be the goal, I think. Um, however, knowing very well the current, current issues and how deeply rooted they are, 
and in Poland how big, big, big the role of the Catholic Church is and how much influence it has on the state. It sometimes seems a work that has to be done over generations. So my hope is maybe in the newer, in the younger generations that gonna have the access to certain information that maybe I didn't have as a teenager and that you know, the connections and, and the possibilities of forging connections, like transnational connections, like we are doing here, that this is going to bring about um, more socially conscious and aware individuals in the future that are going to constitute the society. We have on the one hand side the state that is representative of the heteropatriarchal order and actually in, in the examples that we are listening to now actually implementing patriarchal violence in banning abortion for example. What is your perspective as being part of a constituent um, assembly, what is your perspective on that? Yes. Um, well, the first place I have to say that uh, being as part of a social movement, we weren't part of, uh, we weren't interested actually in being part of institutional politics for a lot of time. So we had, were very, we had a, like, a major, um, our idea of politics was how we, from below, we could manage to, from strikes, from the possibility of social mobilizations, uh, we were actually engaging in a mass politicization process uh, that was going on outside the institution, outside the state. Nonetheless, of course, we understand the, the centrality to dispute the, the state. But now we can say that we're not only going to be disputing to be part of its order of, or part of what it's given, no? but we're all right now being part of the transformation of the form of the state in Chile. And that's very important because in a way we're not only being in, we're not in, we were never interested in being integrated to the state or the forms of institutionality. But nowadays we can say that we're changing and transforming that forms so as to make it possible for others to be part of um, politics and be part of uh, places such as uh, the Congress and others. So it's very important because, for instance, today we are uh, actually engaging in a radical transformation of democracy in Chile that's not only about the paritarian, that's of course a very major issue, but also it will have a political representation of indigenous people throughout a plurinational um, perspective of the state. It also will engage in a new mechanism of popular participation, such as laws and plebiscites that didn't exist in Chile. So I think it's important that we understand this not only as a, uh, in a binary way as well, no? like outside or inside institution, but how can we also transform institution and like always engage, for us at least it's important to engage in a movement that can dispute the power in those places, but always being part of uh, street and mass mobilizations. Um, I, was, I just wanted to say, like I was thinking, and for us it's very important about authoritarian, uh, uh, a feminist perspective on authoritarianism, is uh, Julieta Kirwood, who's a very important, who's a feminist intellectual in Chile, a very important intellectual for us. And she um, was part of the feminist movement in the 80s in Chile. And this is one of the moments uh, precisely under the dictatorship of Pinochet where there was this, this very important uprising of a feminist movement that understood that to end with the, that we was, it, one of its main um, demands was, it was necessarily, necessary, the necessity of democracy in the country, but also in the houses. And that's a very like, interesting idea because it's, it aims to say that authoritarianism is not the, it's not only part of how the state is organized, of course, a dictatorship is organized, but also how we live in the intimacy of our domestic uh, experiences. And well, she was also a socialist militant, and she would say, and I love this I quote when she says, the complex socialist path, path is more than the path of the state. It is the road by which life is changed. So um, I guess that's 
our perspective of a socialist or feminist socialism, of a perspective of a, the change of life that, of course, has to do with the state, but not, not only with that growth. Thank you very much. Um, so we have one last question to all of you before you include uh, your questions. Um, because we were speaking throughout the conference a lot about um, internationalism and the possibility of transnational solidarity, and it seemed that many people here on the panels agreed that the right is very good at being internationalist <laughs> right now and having their nationalist um, networks all over the world. Um, and uh, the left doesn't seem to be very able to do that in that sense um, right now. But still, in feminist movements, I feel that there was a big, big transnational movement at the same time. And Veronika Gago, for example, from Ni Unamenos was speaking about a new feminist international that is happening um, with the feminist strikes going on and everything. So I wanted to uh, ask all of you what you think, how the queer and feminist movements are connected transnationally right now? Where is the links like happening and where is it still missing? Who wants to start? <laughs> Maybe Magdo? I think this is a very important issue and this is, as I was also speaking before about the struggles are not completely disconnected. The struggles that we face, they transgress borders. They cannot be made into an emblem like a national flag, for example. And I think today with the different possibilities of communication that we have and having access to information and having the possibility of exchanging our lived experiences, uh, I feel like this is important to support each other's struggle and understand that um, we can learn from one another and at the same time to not take the Western um, perspective as given as a standard. I think I like what Javiera just said, we're not a repetition of you know, the second wave feminist movement, we're not a repetition, for example, of queer identities. The Eastern European queerness is not a repetition of Western European queerness. And we have to include all those different voices and understand those differences and where can we find things that you know, what did work for you? What did work for that community? Maybe we can use that or understand maybe this is not going to work for us, but we can reform things. And I think the the feeling of a transnational, queer, feminist, transfeminist community is very important. And this is something that we should also put a lot of work into creating with being respectful and not into creating one mass of people, but understanding that there is so much power in coming together and opposing those struggles together. Yes. Um, I, well, I want to say two things. First, uh, that I really think uh, that international support is uh, very, very important. But as well, I guess that um, a feminist perspective of this idea of a new internationalism stands by the uh, key element that we understand that every other uh, struggle is our own in, in a very like concrete sense. When we see what's going on, for instance, in Poland, we were we, when we knew what was going on with the ban of abortion, that had a very important impact on our struggle. And we understand from that idea how you, uh, this uprising of a feminist movement and how important it was to create this cycle of feminist strikes. It was like a very uh, concrete way in which that impact in different forms. Uh, in the same way when we saw, for instance, um, in Brazil, Elenao and how the feminist uh, black movement was one of the first 
to stand against fascism, that was very important to, for us also to understand the extent of what we call this historical vertex between the uprising of a fascist movement and this uh, authoritarian shift against the possibility of an alternative uh, that comes from below from a feminist perspective. Um, the same, I guess, what, ha what is going on uh, when we also see not only from our, our perspective of change, but also when we see the extent of uh, the crisis that we are living in, when we see what's going on in the United States with Roe versus Wade, that's of course going to have an uh, impact on our uh, on how the not only the right but also the left is going to think on how that that impacts uh, even Chile or other places. So um, I think that of course the far right, and they are uh, constructing their own forms of internationalism, and they are actually very, being very, um, they're learning a lot ones from the others. We can see that the, in a very direct form how, for example, how the right wing from Chile is, comes to Spain and talks to Vox, and they're also talking to the Polish, and they're also talking to like these, and they're repeating their these same communication strategies and stuff. And we must do not only the same, but we must be stronger forms of internationalist um, strategies that learn not only of what uh, has strengthened other movements, but also of the mistakes and also of what has. Uh, of the crisis of one another. So uh, I guess it's like a major necessity in a very interconnected world, but especially today, we, uh, I guess that the feminist movement can like help not only to understand how one country or one nation helps another or parts of another's uh, struggles, but that there's a movement that maybe has no form of nation or state. Actually, we were just talking about that before we um, came here to the panel, like outside, that um, that we have to lose our fear of the differences and on the contradictions, but all, but rather have like the posture of learning from these contradictions and even sometimes it getting difficult and tense, but we still can learn from the contradictions, right? So thank you very much. We would like now to open the um, panel for the audience. And our suggestion would be to get like, like maybe you have comments, um, you have questions probably, um, but also feel free to comment actually. And um, we would like to collect like two or three statements more or less, and um, then you can answer them. And we will have like half an hour for that more or less. So, I don't know, it's, um, uh, ah, you do it, okay, perfect. Thanks for another great panel. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Javiera, uh, I mean, your account of this movement in Chile is just amazing. Uh, I'm really curious about the politics of this kind of feminism that you're describing. Uh, with the politics of plurinationality and indigenous struggles in Chile. So I just love to hear about that. Yes, well, I just wanted to say I find it very interesting to hear about this um, dialogue. Uh, and because I guess it's part of the contradictions and the hard questions we are, we are trying to do when we talk about um, going forward against essentialism, but at the same time against the appropriation of our identities. So, and in that sense, uh, it has a lot to do with this idea between feminism and plurinationality, uh, and of course this uh, major idea of alliances. Uh, I must say that uh, the feminist movement, and especially I, in, uh, in that us, uh, in the Coordinadora Feminista, 8M, we are very, uh, bonded with the uh, indigenous um, demands and struggles through, through the years. I must say that uh, in a way we have, um, the way we understand, for instance, the 18th of October and its, its extent, it's also in a way, it has two major for us uh, social protagonisms. One is a feminist uh, protagonism, but also this decolonizing, decolonizing 
politicization of the politics and also of the public sphere. And it's very interesting how, for example, um, the process of a revolt, it also had um, the expressions in, the, in a very um, similar way for instance, how the feminist movement made different interventions in the city to change the names of the uh, stations of the subways or, for example, to, um, to even intervene different monuments. Uh, you could see uh, in a very similar way there was this um, process of, of to decolonizing the city by actually throwing away monuments that are the um, incarnation of a very colonial uh, history in Chile. So um, I must say that the revolt, its potency, its from the first moment has this very, these two forces like very interconnected, and then throughout the constituent process, um, it's very, it's been very, very important the relationship with. Uh, women indigenous constituents, for instance, Elisa Loncon, who was the first president of the Assem Constituent Assembly, as well as Rosa Catrileo, Tiara Aguilera, um, Natividad Yanquileo. And I guess it's very important for me to say their names because I hope you will be hearing from them a lot uh, in the future. And it's a very important moment today in Chile how we can say that uh, the, the forms of political representations are changing as far as the possibility to change, as Rosa is constantly saying, the names of the people who are being part of this, uh, not only of this moment, but on the future. Um, in Chile, we have a very uh, clear, uh, and a very, um, the continuity of neocolonialism is also a very important issue and how that uh, has a very direct relationship between, with the forms of, uh, of our, of the neoliberal system in Chile in a very in the very direct forms. For instance, how in the south of Chile, in the Walmapu, there's the forest uh, companies. They are actually in the very same uh, territories of indigenous. So when there's the protection of those, uh, of the forestales, of the uh, forest companies, it's in the very same sense uh, a devastation and of the territories of uh, indigenous people. And that's some of the things that are going to change in this process. So for us, in the first place, I have to say that we um, understand feminism as well as and necessarily a process that uh, it's been permanently constructing itself in a very situated way. So we can't repeat, as I was saying before, other feminisms be precisely because we are understanding it between uh, in the uh, in the forms of understanding not only these alliances but these forms of understanding, for instance, the forms of a um, Mapuche feminism, or the forms of an indigenous feminism, the form of a different um, uh, and the extent of that possibilities. And but I think it's also interesting to know that there have been tensions about that. For example, and that a very precise example, uh, we are talking about. Uh, this idea of a plurinational state has different forms, and one of them, and a very interesting form of that, is legal pluralism. That it recognizes that in a very that in a this new justice systems there are going to be different legal forms, and that recognizes the possibility of a, um, the legal recognition of uh, in dif the different um, nations can have and how their own legal um, constructions are recognized in the processes. And I say that example because one of the, uh, from, um, from a white feminist point of view, there were once some people who would say, okay, that can be against, for instance, the, um, the defense of women's rights in some cases. And that was actually a very interesting discussion but the interesting part of the discussion is what's, how can we make this uh, a discussion not from the outside, not like understanding that there's the feminists from one side and the indigenous people from the other, but how can indigenous feminists can actually uh, respond to that? And that's what actually happened. And, for, and that was the case of Tiare Aguilera, who's uh, very, uh, who's um, from Rapanui, you should know, like this island, uh, 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 that's in Chile, and uh, Easter Island. <clears throat> and she was a, had a very interesting take on that, on how to understand 
and the relationship between the possibility of a feminist justice as well as a, uh, that has recognized uh, legal pluralism. Um, so, well, I'd say that that's, that's also a very important like idea that's nowadays actually being uh, um, imaginated now. And at, and at the same time, I have to say two more things. The political violence that we've been uh, uh, that we've uh, experienced throughout these years, of course, has a very, like, very direct target. And it's especially to feminist and uh, indigenous women. And it's like absolutely direct. And the forms of how far right uh, have uh, directed their, and especially throughout social media, and not only by that, also you can see it in the streets, they're actually like with uh, posters and stuff. Uh, with hate speech, um, they're a very, uh, a very targeted form of uh, response. And of course, we can see how like this, um, the authoritarian language and these forms of a far right uh, response to these changes has like a very con como concrete target. And today, for example, uh, the main way they're going to, they're trying to criticize uh, the constitution is because it's an, an indigenous constitution, it's because it's a migrant constitution, and because of um, ideology of gender. So it's the same, actually, like the very same recipe that they're repeating in every other place. And uh, we saw Colombia, and for us, it's very important to see what happened in the referendum in Colombia, so we cannot like underestimate the power of that. Uh, so, in a way, I can say it's like how we are trying to uh, produce an alternative and a transformative alternative through these alliances and these alliances of the future for me, between feminist and plurinational um, aims. But at the same time, we are being actually the very same who are precisely targeted. So we are the others to them. And so we, uh, in those both senses, we, of course, we need to, um, be, to stay together to confront that. We actually have a little bit more time for some more comments or questions if everybody, if everyone wants to say something or comment on something. Since the microphone is closed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was somebody else? Okay, shortly, I couldn't uh, stop thinking of the ideological divisions that are present in the, for instance, feminist landscape in Turkey while listening to you. And there's like great divides now um, between, let's say, I mean, there's of course the trans exclusive feminists and nationalists and nationalist Kemalist, anti-immigrationist and so on. And I mean, it's also self-identify, I mean, they identify as uh, feminists and there's there's great tension going on. I mean, ideological wars and social media wars, but also physical uh, during 8th of March, for instance. And we are in the process of, you know, trying to f find a form of communication, or maybe not. Like maybe there is dissensus, and it it needs to be left at that. I mean, while thinking of you know learning from each other, unifying, standing. Uh, in solidarity, there are these tense, tense moments that it's not possible because of the ideological, political orientations. I want to, I don't know, if you want to share some experiences or tactics that you have developed in different contexts in relation to this, that would be very nice to hear. Thanks. Thanks so much for a fantastic uh, panel. To all of you, my question is very short and is to Margo. Margo, sorry. Um, so you mentioned this, this situation of uh, villages or cities in Poland that are LGBT, LGBTI plus free. So I, I mean, I, I understand that it means that they are clear out. So queer people cannot live there because there is like, some kind of social reaction towards them. Is that right? So, and if so, yeah, if so, my, my question is, so because right now it seems pretty nasty, the situation for queer people in different countries, in East Europe, all, all around the world, but in, in Hungary is more or less the same. And then my question is, if there is the opposite of that, 
you know, like villages or small towns that are welcoming queer people to live there and to have a safe life. And I think because it is usually assumed that um, many rural villages are more conservative, but eventually they can be also more solidar they can have more solidarity towards different kind of people that are not uh, welcome in other areas. So yeah, that's my question. So uh, if I may, then maybe I'm going to try to answer both. I'm going to start with this question. So what happens in those LGBT free zones is that any kind of access to information, it's not that uh, queer people are go being active, uh, thrown out of their houses, for example, but if you are visibly you know, a queer person, then you're definitely going to have it even harder than elsewhere. And also there was, uh, I think it was 2018, there was this um, uh, right-wing newspaper that released stickers that you could put on, uh, I don't know, windows or doors or whatever, and that said LGBT free zone. And they also said like, you know, if you are, for example, a business owner, a shop owner, you can put it on your door meaning that you know people queer people are not uh, welcome or it happens that some business owners reject certain uh, orders for uh, there was a huge thing about a bakery that didn't want to make a rainbow cake or something like that a huge printing company that said they're not going to print rainbow posters so those those Free, LGBT free zones are not something that is actively um, persecuting queer people if they try to merge with the rest of the Catholic society. However, if you, for example, if you go to uh, Białystok, which is a, a city in the eastern uh, Poland, and you join Pride, y there are people who bring homemade bombs with them to the Pride, or people who are going to throw stones at you. And there are people, you know, it happens now, like these years. So, and there is also no protection for queer people who are being victims of this kind of violence, because there is, in the Polish law, there is no, um, no law saying uh, that um, violence, gender, not gender-based, but uh, violence motivated by homophobia or transphobia is, being, is going to be punished. There is not even such thing. Um, so that's, that's one of those things. And to answer the second part of the question, if there are other places, um, some uh, bigger cities are easier to live for queer people, for sure. But also it depends, because Białystok is one of the bigger cities, but it's definitely not easy to live there for people who are queer. Um, Warsaw is the, city, the, the, um, the capital city. I just came back from Warsaw. I have to say that I took off my rainbow and trans flag pins from my bag. I was very conscious and careful and was going to places. If I saw that there is a rainbow flag in a place that I felt safer. Um, for example, I come from Poznań, which is also a bigger city and it's um, supposed to be a city with a very well or fast developing queer scene. And I happened to perform there one week, but then the next week in front of the place where I was performing, the rainbow flag was burned. Um, so you have those green islands of acceptance and even places that celebrate queerness, but once you step outside, because it's never a whole city, it's never a whole place, it's, it's a bar, it's a club, it's a scene, it's a uh, collective, but outside of that, you are always constantly thinking in the back of your head, is someone following me? Is someone, is some, does someone see me? How do people read me? Um, so I know that there is, for example, a small uh, town where the mayor is a lesbian, I think, and people are super happy, but I think that's like one place in the whole country um, in terms of smaller places. And usually rural areas are, people are even closer to the church or even closer to tradition. And also in those smaller rural areas, um, you know, currently, just to kind of show you or explain how the 
authoritarian um, populists, uh, how they operate is that the biggest oil company in Poland bought the biggest press agency, the Polish press agency. And uh, of course, the, the oil company is completely political, completely in the hands of the political party of uh, the law and justice party that is, you know, our populist government and our authoritarian government. So now through this oil company that owns the press company, they have access to approximately 17 million people through local newspapers and websites. And they are already exchanging editors, editors in chief, journalists. It's already happening. It's already happening. It, uh, I think it, the, the merge happened last year and it was quite, you know, not very spoken about. And um, those are smaller local newspapers, not in the big cities where there is maybe one big local newspaper and they're going to have, it's the, you know, the, the propaganda kind of tube for the ruling party. And to say, I wanted to also say about the divisions. Um, I think that there's something that has to be pointed out. And I feel like, for example, uh, TERFs, so people who exclude trans people, um, I don't think they should even be called feminists because they're not. And I think that those people in a couple of years are going to be ridiculed and pointed out for their basically fascist views. And I think that's something that is going to be um, is going to be understood by more people as we progress with our openness to uh, various, for example, um, gender identities, that we're going to look back and people are going to say, how could you ever have said something like this? How we've seen with many other social divisions and ways of categorizing people and excluding them. So that's to from my point of view, to answer that question. Um, I'm, I agree <laughs> with that uh, last, well, I was thinking at, uh, how we've done it. I can share how, what we've done this 8th of March and for the general feminist strike. And, and in a sense, when I show this poster, for example, that's a very concrete form of how we uh, responded to the need to say, um, not just to, to point out all these categories, but actually to, ex to show the extent of the possibility of change that we are demanding and that we are committed with. And I guess that uh, trans-exclusionary feminism is a way to, to understand like, of another form of this authoritarian shift that's occurring in the in the very social movements, and I have to say that I guess it's a very important issue that we have to be very outspoken about. Because, for example, we have a very um, very visibilized movement, and for instance, our social media is very has a lot of followers and very young uh, followers. And it's important for us how to teach about this because we know that. Um, this has become, a very, in a way, some form of trend in very young women in Chile, and as much as in Argentina and in Spain, and like how that also is being shared and being like, um, and they're trying to make it even like more visible. And I guess that uh, we've been able to push um, and to um, to fight the extent of that precisely by being very outspoken, very forward about our politics, uh, and also um, trying to to understand what is why is that going on as well. We can't just only um, reject it as well, much as we have to do it, but as well we have to understand why is that going on and why is this uh, authoritarian shift also going on in the midst of social movements and in that's the form in how it's going on in the in the feminist movement and but it's also that we can i guess it's important to see how it's going on in ecological movements and other forms of movements and nationalist movements etc um so i guess that's a very complicated necessary question and that we cannot like skip it we cannot just like uh, 
trying to make alliances that don't, don't see that as a major difference and as well just don't only decide not to, to interrupt that connection and not uh, making something about it. Because for us, um, and just uh, we are trying to, to be part of this massive political uh, pol politicization process. And it's, of course, uh, being held in with a lot of contradictions and differences. So, and with a lot, with a lack of um, a lot of uh, tools and education, and of course, it's very hard. And I guess that's part of our uh, one of our main struggles as well. Thank you very much for taking the time for preparing your inputs. It was such a smooth process preparing this panel with all of you, and now I think um, it turned out really well. I hope, I guess. <laughs> And also, thank you very much to the audience. I, I really liked the, the discussion. It was so, it was so enriching. And um, last but not least, we also want to thank, um, of course, um, Ulka, Eileen, and Errol, who supported us. And we were um, discussing the first ideas um, about this panel together. And also, a huge thank you to Katrin, Jan, David, and Burius, who provided um, this, this, um, this conference. And also, of course, event management, technical support without this, it wouldn't happen anyways.